improved characterization of truck traffic volumes and axle load for mechanistic empirical pavement design. It was conducted by Dr. Ala Abbas at the University of Akron. If you are watching on the webcast and you have a question you would like to ask to the professor, you can send an email to research at dot.state.oh.us. The email address is in the upper right-hand corner of the PowerPoint presentation. We will refer those over to Dr. Abbas. Please feel free to email him at any time. Uh, with that, Dr. Abbas. Good afternoon, and thank you for uh, joining me in this uh, presentation. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Abbas. I'm from the University of Akron. I'd like to thank my graduate student, Mr. Andrew Frank Hauser, who's also in the audience, who helped me in working for uh, on this project. Uh, I would like to also uh, thank uh, Mr. Roger Green, Mr. Eric Morris, Mr. Adam O, Mr. Patrick Birrell, Mr. Dave, Mr. Dave Gardner, uh, Ms. Lindsley Plum, and uh, Mr. Tony Munch. Uh, Mr. Tony Munch is retired, and uh, I also congratulated Mr. Roger Green for recently uh, retiring from ODOT and his uh, service to ODOT. Uh, the following is the outline for uh, my presentation. I first uh, will go over the background uh, to uh, highlight the problem statement that we have in here, the objectives. Then I'm going to uh, provide an overview of the required MEPDG uh, traffic inputs. MEPDG stands for Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide. Uh, then I'm going to go for the uh, Visual Basic for Application Code uh, that was developed for uh, this project in order to analyze traffic monitoring data and obtain the required MEPDG traffic inputs. Uh, I'm going to show some uh, traffic analysis uh, results. I'm going to briefly talk about the uh, impact on pavement performance. Then I'm going to discuss the recommendations for implementations, and we're going to end with uh, questions. The focus on this in this presentation is going to be on the traffic analysis results and less on the pavement uh, performance because of uh, the uh, time allotted for this presentation. Background, uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation Pavement Design Manual is based on the 1993 AASHTO Pavement Design Guide. Recently, a new pavement design guide was developed under the National Cooperative Highway Research Program to address the shortcomings of the 1993 AASHTO Design Guide the new guide is known as the Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide, which I'm going to refer to as the MEPDG. Uh, the MEPDG provides several features that uh, were included or as, uh, that were viewed as limitations in the 1993 Ashton Design Guide, and these features include mechanistic empirical procedures in predicting pavement performance. So instead of just purely empirical, we have mechanistic empirical procedures in predicting pavement performance, accommodation of changes in material properties over time, and uh, representation of traffic using axle load spectra by axle type. And the focus in this presentation is on the last one, which is the representation of traffic using axle load spectra by axle type. Now, to accommodate the transition to the empirical, mechanistic empirical pavement design approach, the MAPDG requires more detailed uh, traffic information that what we have previously used in the 1993 ASHTO Design Guide. Therefore, to advance the implementation of the Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide in Ohio, there is a need for an, an automated tool that uh, can be used to assemble traffic count and axle load information from operational traffic monitoring systems within the state. So we're going to take that traffic information data, generate traffic inputs that can be used in the Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide. As such, the objectives of uh, this project are to develop a methodology to obtain the required MEPDG traffic inputs using available project-specific and regional traffic data, and then implement the developed methodology into a user-friendly uh, software, and that's the VBA code. Um, the Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide, this is a screenshot of the Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide, uh, on the top in here, you can see that uh, the inputs, we have some general information that we need to define. We have traffic, climate, and some information about the pavement uh, structure. The focus in this project is on the traffic inputs for the MEPDG. These traffic inputs include base year, annual average daily truck traffic, traffic volume adjustment factors, including the directional and lane distribution factors, 
hourly truck distribution factors, monthly adjustment factors, uh, vehicle or truck classification distribution factors, and traffic growth factors. In addition, we have the axle load distribution factors, which are defined for each truck class, which includes truck vehicle classes 4 through 13. I'm going to show a schematic that uh, shows these pictures. And axle type, which are included, divided into or classified into single, tandem, tridem, and quad. Uh, general traffic inputs include number of axles per truck, uh, lateral traffic wander, axle and wheelbase configurations, tire characteristics, and inflation pressure. The last three in here are information that we cannot get from the traffic monitoring data, so we're just going to use the default inputs for these particular ones. Okay, this schematic in here uh, shows a, uh, this picture in here, or this figure in here shows a schematic of the various vehicle uh, classes. Uh, vehicle classes one, two, three include a motorcycle, passenger car, and a pickup truck. These ones are viewed not to contribute to damage of pavement structure. Therefore, we're going to focus on vehicle classes 4 through 13. Uh, four are presented in here. We have a bus, uh, single unit truck, and then uh, 5 through 13 include the different types of uh, trucks. The most common type of truck is the semi-trailer. And the most common semi-trailers include single, tandem, and tandem axles. Basically, five axles classified into single, tandem, and uh, tandem. For the calculation of the annual average daily truck traffic, it's recommended to use the Ashto equation for that purpose that is based on the day of week concept. And the advantage of this equation is that uh, it eliminates some of the shortcomings that might present in the data if you have some missing information. Uh, because in general, uh, truck traffic is consistent based on the day of week. However, there are big differences between the weekdays and the weekends. Uh, the monthly adjustment factors uh, are calculated by uh, dividing the average monthly daily truck traffic for each individual uh, day of week and truck class divided by the uh, uh, average monthly daily truck traffic for the whole year, which is basically the summation of the 12 uh, months. The axle load spectra are calculated as the frequency distribution. The MEPDG also allow the cumulative distribution, but the frequency distribution is more common, of axle load repetitions for a particular truck class and axle type, and they are inputted into the MEPDG in a standard format, and that standard format include 3,000 to 41,000 pounds at 1,000 intervals for single, uh, 6 to 82,000 pounds uh, at 2,000 pounds intervals, and for Tridem and Quad, we're getting from 12 to 102 at 3,000 pounds intervals. So that information has to be inputted to the M Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide in a standard uh, format. Now, if you are dealing with a project where you have a way in motion uh, sensor located at that uh, location or at that site, you can obtain very accurate traffic data. And for that, you can use level one, which is the highest level of accuracy uh, for project-specific data. But if you're dealing with a location where you don't have that information, uh, the MEPDG allows you to use level two or level three, where level two and level three are less accurate than level one. Level two is based on statewide averages, and level three are based on the MEPDG defaults, which are the national defaults. So the most accurate is level one. If you don't have level one, you go to level two, which is statewide averages. And if you don't have statewide averages, you can go to level three, which is basically the MEPDG uh, default values. The traffic monitoring data set that we used in this project included 93 automated vehicle classifier uh, that provides volume as well as classification data, as well as 50 way-in-motion sites that provide weight, volume, and classification data. So way-in-motion provides the uh, most comprehensive information uh, but AVCs also provide volumes and classification. 
Uh, in comparison to other states, Ohio has one of the most comprehensive traffic monitoring program that allowed us uh, to really have very detailed information uh, as will be shown in this uh, presentation. The analysis period that I used in here was 2006 to 2011, keeping in mind that we had a recession during this period. So uh, this is one of the things that I had to look at to see how it affected the traffic monitoring data and how that was going to affect uh, pavement uh, design. Uh, this, shows, this slide shows the distribution of the AVC sites and the way in motion sites, and you can see that they are distributed throughout the state, so that gives us a very good coverage uh, in terms of uh, traffic data. In terms of availability, some sites we had continuous data for the full period, which is the six-year period, whereas for other sites, we had uncontinuous data. The definition for continuous that we used uh, in this research was at least having uh, traffic data covering each day of week in each 12 months. So if you have January through December traffic information for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, each individual month, then that is considered a continuous uh, site. Continuous information is useful because it gives you information about the seasonality of the traffic. You can see how the truck traffic is changing from one month uh, to another or how different is it during the winter than during the uh, summer. For the way in motion data or the weight data in particular, we had less information uh, the reason for that is that we're dealing with 50 sites as compared to 143 sites, which is the AVC plus the weigh in motion, because weigh in motion gives you weight as well as classification, whereas the AVC only gives you classification data. So there is more classification data than weight, but still uh, we have lots of data to really work with. Uh, I'm going to show in the following two slides the distribution with respect to the functional classification. This is the functional classification system that is used by ODOT. Uh, we have functional classifications 1, 2, 6, 7, 9, uh, 8, 9, that gives you the classification for rural uh, roadways, where functional classification 1 is a rural interstate, and then functional classifications 11, 12, 14, 16, 17, and 19 give you the functional classification for the urban roadways where functional classification 11 is an urban interstate. So if you go to a location and the functional classification is 1, you know it's a rural interstate. And if you go to a location and the functional classification at that location is 11, then it's an urban interstate. So now we can also do a comparison between the rural and the urban uh, locations. This shows the distribution of these sites with respect to the functional classification. So you can see the, that the uh, AVC sites are distributed across most of the higher traffic, uh, higher functional classification roadways, only until you get to the local streets. It does not make sense to put a way in motion site at in, on a local street. That's what we're missing. Uh, but again, these are the ones that are less uh, considered when it comes to pavement design. The ones that we typically care uh, more about is the higher traffic uh, interstates and the higher traffic uh, highways. This one shows the distribution for uh, the way in motions versus functional classification, and we can also see that we also have a good spread of data versus functional classification. The VBA code demo. This slide shows an overview of what we have in the VBA uh, code. Uh, I'm going to show several videos that demonstrate the process of analyzing traffic data using this VBA, going from what input files are needed, how do you start the program, how do you analyze the traffic data, what do you get once you analyze the traffic data, then once you are done and you have saved your information in a database, how do we access that database, get summary information to visually determine the quality of the data, and then how to generate these traffic inputs and how to import them into the mechanistic empirical pavement design guide. So the first video that I have in here <coughs> shows the 
uh, traffic inputs. The first type of the traffic inputs is the traffic data. We have C cards and W cards. C cards refer to the classification data. W cards refer to the weight data. This is how the C cards look like. They are text files that are recorded in a standard format with a standard extension. And this is how the text file looks like. So this, each individual file in here, contains information about the total number of vehicles and the uh, classification of each vehicle. So it could tell you you have a 100 vehicle at a certain time, and these 100 vehicles include such and such of class 1s through class 13. So this, these files are going to give you information about the uh, traffic counts. What we are interested in is in the truck counts. <laughs> then we have the W cards that include the weight data. These files contain information about the total weight of a vehicle and the weight on each individual axle in a vehicle and the spacing between the axles. So we can use that information to group the axles and determine what is the total weight on each axle uh, group. So this is the traffic monitoring data from the AVC and the way in motion sites. In addition, I obtained an Excel file from the traffic monitoring section that told me where is that site located, whether it's functional classification 1 or it's functional classification 11, uh, which district, which route, which county, so on and so forth. I need this information in order to generate averages. If I want to average based on functional classification, I need to know what is that functional classification for that site. And the last traffic input in here, which is an optional traffic input, <coughs> is a, an access database that includes the historical traffic data at that location calculated using the uh, calculated by the traffic monitoring section. So when I do my analysis, I can compare to the results that the traffic monitoring section obtained in terms of the annual average daily traffic and the percentage of trucks at each uh, location. Uh, you can see that in some instances you might uh, be able to get a total vehicle count but no percentage trucks and that would again show uh, as a missing information uh, in once we pull that information. But again, I'm calculating it, I'm also comparing it with the results if it's a match then uh, the way we're both calculating it verifies each other, and that's what we found in this project. Uh, <coughs> so it's really a way for me to check my analysis. This is what I'm doing in here. Okay. Now we're going to go to the next <coughs> video. So now... The traffic monitoring section provided the, the data, C cards, W cards, site information, uh, historical traffic information. Again, the historical traffic information is optional. Let's say that you want to use the code to analyze the data. You're going to click on the Excel file where the VBA code was developed. You can go to View Macro, View Macro, click Run on that macro. You're going to get a welcome screen. You can start the Uh, program and once you do that you're going to get this screen you're going to get this screen this screen has three main options analyze traffic data view results generate MAPDG traffic inputs 
If you want to analyze your tra analyze traffic data, you select that option and you hit next. In here, <coughs> you're going to tell the code where is the site information file, tell the code whether you want to analyze C cards and W cards or only one of them, browse to locate the folder where this information is uh, stored, and then tell the code what is the name of the database that you want to save the results to. And finally, you're going to tell the code what is the analysis period. Start here and end here. So in here, I'm going to type in the name of the database, Ohio underscore 2006 to 2011, just to say Basically, this is what I'm analyzing. And in here, I'm going to include the analysis period, 2006 to 2011. And then once you hit the Start button, you're going to get progress bars telling you where the code is in terms of analysis. Uh, at the end of this, I'm not going to run for the whole period. At the end of this, you're going to see all of them getting to 100%, indicating that the analysis uh, has been completed and the results database will be uh, generated. Uh, now, in terms of analysis period, I spent lots of time in this project trying to optimize the process so that the analysis can be performed in the shortest uh, period possible. In here, we're dealing with uh, 10 to 20 gigabyte worth of data. So to analyze that, it will take lots of time. It takes more time to analyze weight data than classification data because the weight data inf contains information about each individual vehicle. Therefore, lots of time again was spent to optimize that uh, memory handling and the, that total period of six years can now be analyzed in about 20 minutes for the classification data and an hour and a half for the weight uh, data. Now, I ran the analysis. I'm going to, the, the results database is going to be generated. This is how the results database looks like. It is generated in Access. It contains multiple uh, tables. The tables are organized by name. Uh, like in here, you can see site general, site traffic. Uh, then we have site weight, and then we have statewide traffic and statewide weight. So you can see where are the site-specific information are and where are the statewide uh, traffic uh, averages are. In addition to the database, I'm creating a text file that gives me a summary of what C cards I analyzed, what W cards I analyzed, where, are, where were these files, how long did it take to do the analysis, uh, so on and so forth. So if anything went wrong, I can go back and check that to see uh, where am I. Now, the results database has been generated. I need to view that. Uh, data. And for that, I created the programming that would allow me to view the results. You can see again, I have two options, traffic counts or uh, way, uh, uh, gross and axle load spectra. I'm going to start with the traffic count. I'm going to look for the database. Once you do that, you, there are, you have multiple options. You can select in here to see the monthly average daily traffic, monthly average daily truck traffic, annual hourly distribution, monthly hourly distribution, annual truck class distribution, monthly truck class distribution, daily truck count, and weekday truck count, if you care about the weekend and the weekday. You have the site, the year, the class. In here, you also have information about the site. And you have summary 
data for the annual average daily uh, annual average daily traffic annual average daily tra traffic data availability so that when you're looking at a certain annual average you can tell is this based on the full 12 months or is it based on just the summer or is it based on just the winter and then in here this is where i'm going to do the comparison with the historical traffic uh, data so now i'm going to run the video you can see how the uh, average daily traffic monthly average daily traffic average daily truck traffic hourly distribution annual hourly distribution monthly uh, no data are represented as zeros annual truck class distribution you can see that there is more class 9 and class 5 and then daily truck counts notice in here that there is this group of data and then this group of data the bottom one is the week and data in here I'm going to compare with historical traffic data for this particular site and this is what I'm getting you can see that uh, for this particular site in 2007 I have 11,000 uh, the historical traffic data is also showing 11,000 I'm getting about 13% uh, the historical traffic data is also showing about 13%. Now, I'm not trying to duplicate what the traffic monitoring section is doing, but I'm trying to use this information to calculate the hourly distribution, monthly adjustment factors, and all of that. So I'm trying to just verify my annual average daily truck traffic so that I can calculate the rest. Okay, so this is the view results, traffic count, and then we have the gross and axle load spectra. <coughs> Again, look for the database. You can see annual gross, monthly gross, annual single, monthly single, annual tandem, monthly tandem, uh, annual tridem, and likewise for uh, quad. Different sites, different vehicle classes. If you put on the monthly, you will see also the years. Let me go back a little bit in here. Okay, uh, again, class nine is the semi-trailers, the most common. For this particular site, you can see that the uh, axle loads are grouped in here and in there. This shows the number of empty trucks and this, or the percentage of empty trucks, and this shows the percentage of full trucks because 80 is the weight limit. And in between, that's basically where it's distributed. It's not uh, empty and it's not full. You can see that for class 13, which is the very large trucks, we don't have too many of them, so you don't get a very clear uh, axle load spectra or gross load spectra. So this allows you to visually look at the results to determine do I have accurate data, do I have consistent data, so on and so forth. In addition to looking at it this way, what we did was to also combine this with ArcMap so that we can look at a single interstate, how does that data change along that interstate to determine whether that data is consistent or not. And again, we found that the data is very uh, consistent. <coughs> so now I'm going to go back to the database and grab summary, generate summary inputs for the MEPDG traffic, uh, pavement MEPDG, PVD, uh, Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide. I'm going to tell the code where is the database. 
I'm going to tell the code where to save the information that I'm generating in. So I'm going to save it in a folder called generated traffic inputs. I'm going to tell the code what is the project ID, route, style, uh, start mile post, end mile post, functional classification. I'm going to tell the code what is the annual average daily tra traffic. This is something that you can get from the database. However, it was decided early on in this project that this information needs to be obtained from the traffic monitoring section. And then you're going to select what level of analysis you're planning to use. Am I going to use site-specific? Am I going to use site-wide averages? Or am I going to use uh, uh, national averages or MEPDG default? I'm going to tell the code which site I'm going to be dealing with. I presume that at this point you've already looked at the site and you decided that the uh, traffic data makes sense. Notice that for some of the options you only have level 3, which is the default because again this is something that we cannot get from anywhere else. Uh, let me put this in here. and show you what will happen once you click the generate button. Okay, once you click the generate button, I'm also generating another text file that gives me a summary of what I chose when I created these inputs. Okay, how do these inputs look like? This is the summary. How do these inputs look like? I'm going to go back to that generated traffic inputs folder and these are the generated inputs based on what I have selected. Uh, these inputs are going to include all the information uh, regarding the base year, AADTT, hourly distribution, monthly adjustment factors, uh, all that kind of information is going to be stored in a format that can be imported into the MEPDG as I will show in a second. So the last one is importing the data into the MEPDG. So this is the traffic data. I'm going to run the MEPDG. I'm going to start a new design. I'm going to go to the traffic, click the import button, locate these text files, import them into the MEPDG. Now once you do that, you can see the traffic inputs, you can browse them and you can check that they are the same as what we have already generated. The MEPDG requires that your total percentage adds up to 100, so I even have the code so that that is automated inside the code to make sure that they add up to 100. Okay, so this gives a demo of the VBA code starting from the inputs to the outputs. How do you see the results and how do you generate uh, data in a format that can be go, uh, imported into the MEPDG? So now let's look at traffic analysis results. Uh, in these slides, I'm going to look at now statewide averages and uh, how do they correlate to some of the averages that are currently being used by the Office of Pavement Engineering for Pavement Design. I'm going to look uh, briefly add the annual average daily truck traffic because again we said that this is not the main focus. Directional and lane distribution, hourly distribution factors, monthly adjustment factors, truck class distribution, growth rate, axle load spectra and number of axles uh, per truck. This slide shows you the annual average daily truck traffic and again we used uh, GIS or ArcMap to look at how 
it changes uh, along interstates. So for in here, along Interstate 71, you can see that we have about 10,000 trucks per day on average. And likewise in here, this is five because we have the sensors located on only one direction. So if you multiply by two, that gives you the 10,000. And likewise for the other locations as well. <coughs> directional and lane distributions. These are the directional and lane distribution factors currently being used by the Office of Pavement Engineering. We have them specified based on the number of lanes. If you have a total number of lanes of two, then your lane factor is going to be 100 because your, uh, the trucks are going to be moving in both directions. Four goes to 90, six goes to 80, and then a directional distribution factor of 50 is used uh, for all number of things. In here, I'm looking at how does my data tell me about these directional and lane distribution factors. What we found is that in general, the directional distribution factor ranges between 50 to 55 percent. Uh, that's on the maximum lane. Of course, if you have 55 percent, the other lane is going to be 45 percent. Uh, some sites might have a very high directionality. So again, that's something to uh, look into. But in general, we're looking at about uh, 50 to 55 percent. But still using 50 percent is acceptable uh, when dealing with the directional dis uh, distribution. For the lane distribution, again, two lanes must give you a 100 percent. Four lanes, you can see that the majority range between 85 and 100. The average that we got was close to 90 percent. So it's close to what ORAT is using, but still we have a large number a little bit higher than 90%. Uh, so uh, ORAT value is uh, average, close to what we're getting. Uh, two lane, uh, six lane uh, highways, we got the data to be mostly less than 85%. Uh, per, uh, percent. So the 80% could be conservative for anything below that 80%. Uh, and uh, for 8 and 10, we notice it's less than 80%. Uh, percent. For the hourly distribution factors, we looked at how the hourly distribution factor uh, changes f based on functional classification. The reason why we decided to use the functional classification is because that's what ORAT is currently using for their pavement design. So we tried to look into it to see how uh, would that be affected if we decide to go for anything different. But we noticed that for the hourly distribution, the functional classification actually gives me reasonable uh, predictions. What you can see in here is that for functional classification one, rural, interstate, uh, the, fun uh, the hourly distribution factor is relatively consistent as indicated by the coefficient of variation. And the hourly distribution is, uh, and the truck count is relatively distributed throughout the day. Even at night, you have traffic going on on uh, rural uh, interstates, and as you move to uh, lower functional classifications from interstates down to uh, even local, now you get, start seeing the effect of the peak traffic in the day and the peak traffic in the, uh, in the morning and the peak traffic in the evening. Uh, at the same time, you start seeing that the coefficient of variation also starts increasing. Uh, that means that your traffic is not being as consistent when you're calculating the average for these locations. For urban <coughs> interstates, again, it's relatively consistent. You can see slightly the peaks, but it's uh, not as well defined as some of the other lower functional classifications, as you can see in here. For the monthly adjustment factors, this, sh this slide shows the average monthly adjustment factor for functional classification one, again, rural interstate. You can see that when you look at class nine, the truck count for class nine is relatively consistent during the whole year, starting from January all the way to uh, December. However, some of the other truck classes uh, have more seasonality. So for example, class seven, which uh, typically includes the end dump trucks, are more concentrated during the construction season than outside the construction season. And class fives, again, show a little bit more seasonality than class nine, but still they're, 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 they're uh, relatively consistent uh, throughout the year. 
uh, in here, this is for urban interstates. Now you can see this is consistent throughout the whole year, and this is consistent throughout the whole year, and you can see the seasonality for class uh, 7. Uh, for the other truck uh, classes, again, this is class 13, some of the larger ones. Uh, for this uh, particular group, which is the urban interstates, there is a little bit more in uh, July and August. But again, that could be different, and that could be dependent on what data we use to calculate these averages uh, on. Okay, Truck class distribution, these are the B to C ratio that ODOT uses for different functional classifications. The B is the multi-unit trucks. The C is the single unit trucks, so multiple unit to single unit trucks. You can see that for rural interstates, we're dealing with 7 to 1. For urban interstates, we're dealing with 4 to 1. What does that mean? That means that for rural interstates, you have 7 uh, multiple unit trucks to 1 single unit truck, whereas on, uh, for urban interstates, we have 4 multiple unit trucks to 1 single unit uh, trucks. Now, these are, again, what is currently being used in pavement design. We uh, decided to look into that based on the data that we have and see how close are we to these values. And what we notice is that in terms of average, we're close. Functional classification, B to C ratio, we're close. However, when you look at the individual functional classification, you can see a very large distribution. What does that mean? That means that if you use this average for this particular site that gave you that value, it's not going to be as accurate. And we know from experience that this uh, is important in pavement design. Therefore, there, could be a, there must be a better way uh, to do that. The uh, mechanistic empirical pavement design guide suggests using the truck traffic classification system to improve uh, the estimation of that B to C ratio or the truck class distribution, the representation of the truck class distribution. And these are the classifications that are suggested in the uh, MEPDG. This is the table according to which you can assign a site to each one of these 17 truck traffic classes. We did that analysis and we went back and looked at what is my site, what is the truck traffic classification that I'm getting corresponding to it. We found that most of the sites belong to TTC1, which is a high percentage of class 9, smaller percentages of class 5. But you can see in here, for example, the difference between TTC1 and TTC2. You can see that seven, Interstate 77 is getting a classification of TTC2 as compared to uh, some of the other major interstates like 71, 70, 75. Uh, they're getting a classification of TTC1. What does that mean? That means that as a percentage, Interstate 77 has less of Class 9 whereas the other ones have more of class 9, more of the semi-trailers. Again, these are the beasts that basically uh, uh, that are most common on our interstates and damage uh, the pavements. Okay, You can see that as you move forward uh, with these uh, truck traffic classification, less and less of them, you can see them. Now, the following problems were identified with this approach. We found it to be very biased toward the percentages of class 5 and class 9. These are the most common but these are biased by them. Uh, is not representative of truck class distributions within the state of Ohio. One thing that we noticed is that this classification system is highly based on truck class 13, whereas in Ohio, we did not see much uh, of, of these, so you cannot really make the system to be based on them. Uh, in Ohio, actually, we found that truck classes 5, 9, and even 11 are more distinct uh, based on interstates. You can see some interstates having large number of class 11, other interstates having a very small percentages of class uh, 11. So as an alternative, we tried to use cluster analysis, but we ended up having the same issue uh, that they all were biased toward class 5 and class uh, 9. Uh, so we looked at the literature and we said, okay, who else did suge suggested an alternative technique and let's try what, uh, to see what they had. Uh, in a recent study funded by the North Carolina uh, Department of Transportation, it was suggested to use two sets of seasonal adjustment factors developed for single unit trucks and multiple unit trucks to estimate the annual 
vehicle class distribution factors. We tried this method and we further refined this method because they only develop factors for single unit and multiple units. We have more traffic data that we can deal with. Uh, the, uh, we have more traffic data uh, that we can use. Therefore, uh, we, can, we could develop seasonal adjustment factors for all truck classes. And this is what we ended up using in this particular study. And based on that, this is the equation that we used. Uh, the seasonal adjustment factor gives you a factor that you can multiply the short-term count, truck counts with to calculate uh, the annual uh, truck count. And uh, this basically shows an example uh, of uh, seasonal adjustment factors for class 5. Uh, you can see in here the ones that I have in bold in here denote the most common period during which the traffic monitoring section uh, collect their traffic short-term counts in, which is April through October. In recent years, we've had very warm Novembers and even before, so we, even February. So uh, again, uh, that can be a little bit extended, but this is the most common. Uh, Monday through Thursday, April through uh, no, uh, October, that's the common period for short-term count. And what we can notice in here is that that seasonal adjustment factor typically ranges between 0.75 to 0.85. Okay, so if you go and conduct a short-term count at a certain location for truck class 5, okay, and you get 100, then most probably the annual average is going to be 100 times 0.75 to 0.85. That's where uh, that annual average would be. So we use that to estimate our vehicle class distribution this is the unadjusted, so before using the seasonal adjustment factors, and this is the adjusted. And what you can notice is that there has not been big change. Using the short-term count as is gives you a decent estimate of the vehicle class distribution. If you use the seasonal adjustment factors, you can see that that improves slightly the estimation. So it's not a big improvement. It's a small improvement. Okay, but still it's more accurate than using the TTC grouping system or using the cluster analysis because it's based on site-specific short-term counts to start with. The growth rate, <coughs> uh, one of the traffic inputs that you cannot get from C cards and W cards is the growth rate or how the number of trucks will change in future years. However, we relied on historical traffic data to look at how that traffic changed over the last 30 years and to see how it's going to affect our estimations in the future. So we picked several locations distributed throughout the state just to see uh, what we have in there. And what we noticed is that one, your growth rate for trucks is not the same as your growth rate for uh, vehicles, total vehicles, okay? These grow in different rates. That's one. The other thing that we noticed for most of the sites, I'll try to find something that uh, looks a little bit clear, is that during the period between 1985 and about 2005, we used to have a linear growth where the number of trucks and vehicles were linearly increasing. But then past 2005, that's when the numbers either started flat or they started going down, okay? What am I trying to say in here? I'm not trying to develop a methodology. I'm not trying to uh, do anything like that. I'm, I'm not trying to give you a values to use. What I'm trying to say is that, one, the growth rates for trucks are different than the growth rates for vehicles. Two, if you want to you develop a growth rate for a particular site, you have to go as far back as you can to predict the future, or you have to rely on modeling, which is currently used by uh, 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 by ORAT to determine how this traffic will uh, change. Uh, it's it's not a simple. It's not as simple as a curve fitting, uh, where you can go there and get your growth rate. That's what you get from certified traffic. So again, I'm suggesting to continue to get it from certified traffic. Uh, for the axle load spectra, we first look at the uh, 
vehicle classification tree that is used by ORAT. We understood uh, how ORAT classifies the vehicles, and we noticed in here that ORAT uses a distance of six feet to group the axles together. Okay, and that's what we used in order to obtain the tandem, tridem, and quad axles for the determination of the axle load spectra. We looked at each individual truck class and we looked at what kind of axle groups we have present in there. So if you have a bus, that bus could either have two axles or three axles. If you have two axles, then both of them are single, single, single. If you have three axles, then one is going to be at the front, that's the single, and then you're going to have two in the back, and that's going to be a tandem. That's what we found from the data. And uh, so on and so forth for the rest of the uh, trucks. Again, for class nine trucks, typically uh, they have five axles. They are either single tandem, tandem, single, two of them, two of them, or single tandem, single, single. How do you determine that? Again, based on the spacing between the trucks, between the axles, sorry. So we did that, and then we calculated the average for the uh, single axle load spectra for each individual uh, truck class, tandem, tridem, and quad. We also did it for the gross. And you can see in here, this is the nine. This is where it is. You can see the empty trucks. You can see the loaded trucks. This is another figure for the nine that also shows the distribution. In here I have the average in blue and I have the error bars representing the standard deviation in calculating that average. So you can see how that looks like for the whole uh, state. Uh, one thing that, can, that these figures can be used for is to update the ESIL factors. If ORAT plans to continue to use the ESILs for uh, a certain period of time, one, the, one, of these, uh, one thing that, can be, that these figures can be used for is to update the ESIL factors for the B and the C uh, trucks, the single unit and the multiple unit uh, trucks. So that is the average. In addition to that, we also used cluster analysis to group weigh-in-motion sites uh, based on annual tandem axle load spectra of class 9s. Class 9s are the most dominant, again, the largest beast on the pavement, and tandem axles. Uh, the two tandem axles in the back are the largest number uh, presented on a highway. Therefore, we use them to do a cluster analysis. We use the uh, squared Euclidean distance, typical uh, methods, either the Euclidean distance or the squared Euclidean distance. We use the squared Euclidean distance, and we use the group average in the cluster analysis. And, based, uh, and we, the software that we used for that is called Statisti XL. Uh, the reason why I chose that uh, software is that it generates a cluster tree in a nice way that can be easily understood. And in this cluster tree, what you can see is that the axle, the tandem axle load spectra for class nine in 2007, 2008, 2006, 9, 10, 11 for site 719 are close to each other. Why do I care? It's just a way to see, is that axle load spectra correct or not? If I see one of these very far down, that means that that is different than the rest of the years. And maybe there is something wrong with that, therefore I have to remove it. However, this shows that these are correct. Now, once, you have done, once you're done with the annual uh, variations or the yearly variations in sites, then you can connect sites with each other based on similarity in axle load spectra and based on that, we found that the following four clusters are dominant. Again, what you can see in here is a variation in the percentage of empty trucks, full trucks, and the variation in the not empty and not full, halfway in between. These are how these clusters uh, looked like. And this is the MAPDG default. You can see how it looks like. Okay. Now, if you look at these two, you will see that this orange one is lighter than the MEPDG default because you have a higher percentage of light trucks, but also have a lower percentage of half, uh, uh, empty half full. Okay? And this peak is at the same location. Now, in terms of 
Where are these sites located? We noticed that cluster one is mainly along interstates. Cluster two, you can see it a little bit more in here, and you can see it uh, some of, along some of these uh, locations, and so on and so forth. So now, cluster four, that's the one that I pointed to, the one in orange that is very light, you can see where they are. They are not along any interstates. These are some of these highways that are subjected to a less uh, traffic. The last input that I'm going to talk about is uh, the number of axles per truck. The rest of the inputs are again going to be default. Uh, the, we analyzed the data to obtain how many single tandem, tridem, quad axles we have for each individual truck class. This in here in green shows the MEPDG default, and this in here shows uh, what we obtained for Ohio. Uh, for class nine, again, class nines can either be single tandem, tandem, or single tandem, single, single. We obtained that on average, a class nine trucks has 1.29 uh, single axles and 1.85 tandem axles. Now, if you do uh, this plus, uh, if you do the percentages, you will get basically the addition to be five. So 1.29 plus two times 1.85 gives you uh, the uh, five. Okay, so these these uh, values are again. Ohio specific because they are based on the Ohio vehicle classification tree. Impact on pavement design, uh, because, because of the limitation in time, I don't want to spend too much time on talking on the impact of, on pavement design. I'll go briefly on what we started with, what we got in terms of results. Uh, this is the baseline pavement, uh, baseline new flexible pavement structure that we started with. Uh, we used the same uh, pavement structure that ARA used in a previous project along with the same material properties and so on and so forth so that we can focus on traffic. And this is the same uh, pavement, uh, rigid pavement structure that ARA used, so we also uh, used that one. And we ran a sensitivity analysis uh, for the flexible and the rigid pavement uh, uh, designs uh, based on the various traffic inputs. What we noticed is that for most of the traffic inputs, we have either moderate or negligible effect, okay? Now, uh, for the number of axles per uh, truck, we noticed a negligible effect. Of course, a negligible effect does not mean that you go there and enter uh, very uh, absurd values. You have to either pick the at least the MEPDG default. That would be reasonably accurate. If you use the Ohio one, it would be more representative. But again, the impact is negligible going from one to the other. And you can see in here that the rest has, again, uh, a moderate. Uh, for the hourly distribution factor, it was observed that if you're planning to run a flexible pavement design, it's negligible. But once you go to a rigid pavement design, it becomes a moderate. Why? Because, again, uh, rigid pavements are affected by variations in temperature during the day and at night. And then the hourly distribution becomes more uh, important. Now, recommendations for implementation. Again, currently we're using the ESL that requires certain inputs to obtain. How can we go to the MEPDG that requires a different set of inputs uh, to uh, perform the analysis? For the AADTT, again, we're going to get it from the traffic monitoring section. This input shall be, uh, tr uh, this traffic input shall be obtained from all that traffic monitoring section. Oh, that traffic monitoring section does a very excellent job actually maintaining that traffic uh, data on their website. You can just go to uh, survey reports and you can pull that information for any location that you want. Uh, the directional distribution uh, factor, we're going to continue to use 50%, keeping in mind that that value really ranges between 50 and 55%. So we are on the low side. For the lane factor, uh, we're planning to use uh, the level two, which is the statewide averages. The recommended values for these ones uh, is 100% for two lane, 95%, a slight increase from 90 to 95% uh, for four lane, 80% uh, for six lanes. But once you go to eight and 10, it, it's recommended to just go to 70 because we didn't see really that many 80% in there. Monthly adjustment factors, uh, the MEPDG default uses one for all vehicle classes and all months. 
that's reasonably accurate to use. You don't have to go through uh, the detailed analysis to obtain that. Vehicle class distribution, this is one of the traffic inputs that we noticed that uh, is critical to obtain using short, site specific short term counts if possible. Uh, if not, you can use for uh, level two or statewide average based on functional classification for the analysis. So try to get site specific short term counts. Uh, that would be as close to the annual uh, vehicle class distribution as possible. If you use the seasonal adjustment factors that we came up with, that might also improve your estimation of the vehicle class distribution. Otherwise, you can go for level two if you don't have any other uh, option. Hourly distribution factor, uh, you can use the level three uh, hourly distribution factors for flexible uh, pavements, uh, whereas for rigid pavements, you can use the level two that depends on functional classification where you can see the morning peak, the evening peak, and the con consistent uh, during the day for the interstates and the non-interstates. Uh, growth rate, you have to go through certified traffic because that makes a big difference in your uh, analysis. There is no magic bullet in there uh, to obtain. ALS uh, for single tandem, trident, and quad, it's recommended to use uh, level two, which is just the statewide average based on information from all sites. We found that that is relatively accurate. You don't really have to do the cluster analysis. You don't have to do uh, anything else. If you have the site-specific ones, you can do the two and you can use the comparison. Uh, uh, number of axles, again, you can use the uh, level two, which is the statewide average. If you use the MEPDG default, it's not going to make a big difference, but it's better to stick to uh, level two. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that all the sensitivity analysis that we performed in this project are based on the uncalibrated MEPDG there's a, a need to do the local calibration and rerun the analysis to verify the findings. Uh, that's a completely different project. Okay. Uh, for the last traffic inputs, lateral wonder, axle configuration, well -based distribu well, uh, wheel base distribution, you can just use the MEPDG default for uh, all of them. Uh, any questions? I can put the advertisement slide for Akron. You say a level two, do you mean level two based on averages based on the functional class? Uh, it depends on which one uh, we're, we're saying. If we're talking about level two for this particular input, which is the lane factor, for example, then you can just use these values, and again, these correspond to the statewide averages. Uh, if we're talking about level two in here, then that's statewide average based on functional classification. It depends on what, where, where it's mentioned. There is an explanation next to it that says, uh, Statewide, this one, for example, is not based on functional classification. This is just the statewide average. Okay? And one reason why I'm saying you can do a statewide average for the axle load spectra is because of the way we perform, I perform the analysis. What do I mean by that? When I calculated the statewide average for the axle load spectra, I kept in mind that at some locations you could have two trucks per day or three trucks per day. So what you will get is an axle load spectra that does not make sense. So I took that information out when I calculated the average and I relied on the sites that have uh, representative data uh, in the calculation. So uh, there are some considerations that are discussed in the report in the calculation of these tight wide averages to eliminate the possibility of you having one truck with 40 tons being used as a statewide average, okay? Okay, well, we don't have any more questions. We haven't gotten any via email, so that's going to conclude the results presentation for now.
Uh, if you do find that you do have questions later on, please feel free to email those to research at dot.state.oh.us, and we will forward them on to Dr. Abbas for a response. The final report for this project, along with a PDF version of the slides and um, MP4 files of the videos that Dr. Abbas showed, will be available on the research website. Uh, you can check there and download them in about a week or so. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you.